We ask all of these things in your precious name. Makai no kamakua, ke keke ame ka uhane hemolele. Mai ke au kumole, ahike ke au pao ole. Amen. Mahalo. So just in case anybody needs a reminder, this first part of the meeting is going to be the representatives here talking out to you folks. So we won't be taking questions or comments from the floor. So if I can just ask everyone to respect that and respect each other. Aloha. Oh, come on. There's a lot of people in the room. Aloha. Aloha. That's, that's what I like to hear from Puna. Uh, folks, we're here today for this town hall, and I feel so grateful. OK. Can you hear me now? Yeah? I can boom. I have a pretty loud voice. Um, I'm so grateful to have here today Joyce Ann Buenaventura, our representative for the State House from District 4, Senator Russell Ruderman from our district, District 2, and U.S. Representative Tulsi Gabbard, who is our representative in Washington, D.C. Woo! There was a little bit of a challenge to get us all together at the same time. And I'm so grateful we were able to pull that off. So thank you all for coming. And this is, to me, an important start. On May 3rd, we all remember the start of this um, eruption. It impacts our lives in so many ways. So many of us have lost, lost homes, lost land, lost places of the best memories of our lives. We've lost agriculture. We've lost our fishery. And we've lost a school. We have lost a lot. But if we work together, we can rebuild a Puna that is even better than what was here before. And I can count on you folks, because you're still here in spite of all of that to do that, to do that work that we need to do to bring our community together to make Puna a really great place. Now, since the eruption started, of course, my focus has changed a little bit. I ended up finding myself on social media a whole lot more, not just posting uh, pictures, but posting announcements, posting corrections to some misinformation to make sure that my constituents were out of harm's way, safe, and getting correct information. That was the first few weeks, and we all remember how um, wound up we all were. Finally, when Pele formed the river of lava that flows through our district and kind of settled into a pattern, it wasn't great for Kapoho, eradicated the whole Kapoho village, um, excuse me, beach lots and vacation land in short of three, four days. But because there was some regularity to it, we could unwind a bit. At least I found that was true for myself. And then I began to realize how hard this has been on everybody. Don't ever underestimate the psychological and physiological impacts of this event. It's volatile, it's dynamic, but it's also creation. It's destruction at the same time, but it's also creation. So let's learn from that creative force and create a Puna that is better than what we had before. One of the things I did um, to help the people get information was to host a forum, an insurance forum, because Many of us that lost our properties were not either properly insured or had a lot of questions about our insurance policies. That meeting was very well attended and was held down at uh, Hawaiian Shores Stables. The other thing that I found was lacking was we needed to reach out to the ASPCA 
in the mainland to help our Hawaii Island Humane Society deal with rescuing all of the animals that were abandoned. Some of these animals were pets, some of them were farm animals. And we're still reading today in the paper about those rescues. I don't know why it took so long to um, call ASPCA, but I got on the phone as soon as I heard there was a problem and made the call to the executive director. And that very afternoon, ASPCA committed to coming over and they were here within two days and they've been here helping. So thank you. All of us sitting at this table were also at the state uh, Democratic Convention just um, a month or two ago. It seems like ages ago. And at that convention, someone had the great idea, I think it was our party treasurer, of passing the hat. So we did that. I think it was a pickle jar. But we passed it around the room and we were able to collect over $1,500, which we then spent on tarps and tents and totes to bring back to Puna to disseminate to the evacuees. Also bought gas cards and suds and duds coupons supporting local businesses here in Pahoa and passed those out to the evacuees as well. So that was a um, thank you to the State Democratic Party because those were all individual donations that went into that effort. I also wrote a resolution that passed the county council unanimously asking for a state legislature special session. And in order to have a successful special session where they can decide how to help Puna recover, we need plans. We need to put options before the state legislature. So that's part of why we're here today is to try and um, get those ideas and put together those plans. We've made some starts, and, and um, uh, the representatives and the senator will tell you some of the work they've done to date in putting together those plans for short-term housing, long-term housing, uh, agriculture, all of the above. I thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we were having a little problem getting this arranged, and I just want to thank our sign interpreter. Thank you. Um, and so, I'm going to pass the mic over to Representative Joyce M. Buenaventura, who's going to speak just for a few minutes. Thank you. I, I, all of us had just come from a blessing of the micro units over there at Sacred Hearts. And one of the things that was brought home to me at that blessing was that all of, you know, all of the community came together. One person's idea, Gilbert Aguinaldo, morphed into talking to Daryl Oliveira, who was with HBM, morphed into talking to Hope Services, who talked to Tulsi Gabbard. Oh, Gilbert Aguinaldo also talk, reached out to Tulsi Gabbard because money is needed to come through. And one of the things that, you know, I hate about being in government that we are all in is government is slow. So the good thing about knowing about, about, about us being in government is we know people. And Tulsi, with her, with her ledge aid, was able to get United Way to come up with a seed money, the $100,000 plus um, donations from Mormon Church. The faith community, by the way, came through humongously to put that together, um, and to put the seed money for the materials to put, as well as all of the helping hands, you know, Habitat for Humanity, National Guard. They had a list, an hour-long list of people who came together to put the 20 homes that they are now going to start opening up for some families right out here at Sacred Hearts Church. So what I want to point out was something that Gilbert Aguinaldo brought up at that blessing was that this disaster, although it ruined a lot of lives and a lot of homes, has also brought Puna together. The students in this school at the time of their graduation this year 
pointed out that when they started school in Pahoa High in 2014, it was a 2014 lava flow, and half of them had to go over to Keao. And at the time that they're graduating, now it's their homes that are being taken over. They pointed out about resiliency. So what I want to point out is, and, and, and I'm really so thankful that FEMA is there. By the way, before I forget, FEMA and SBA is going to be open on July 4th over in Keao High. Okay? And before I forget, we have 60 days, which ends sometime in August. You can ask Dana at FEMA when that is, of when you need to register to get any benefits. So now is not the time to delay. You need to register to get benefits. And I know that there is some um, Pilikia, some problems with whether or not you're in a voluntary evacuation zone or a mandatory evacuation zone. And I know some of you have already been denied, but you still need to register. And we're hoping that those evacuation zones then becomes mandatory so that that way you will be able to get your benefits. All of these people are doing their best to help you. And I see Elizabeth here. She, sat, she sits next to me at the disaster um, assistance recovery team once a week, right? We try to meet once a week. And these are volunteer, we have volunteers from all around the country coming here. We, we, as the governor has pointed out, we have had more resources here in Pune than ever before in any other part of the, of the state. And people are more than willing to help. So I know that we are not there for you perfectly, and I know government is slow. So what I have done, and as um, Eileen O'Hara has told you of what she has done, May 3rd was the last day of the legislative session. And on that last day, the day before, we had passed a $100 million package for Kauai. Okay? And I asked on May 3rd whether or not that, at that time, okay, before session ended, all we had were all these earthquakes. That was before Ikai Komarzo posted about that first fissure that opened up over Leilani Estates. And I asked at that time, while it... Uh, Yes, thank you, Ikaika. Okay, thank, thank you so much. I asked whether or not we could get any of those monies, okay, and, and, and the answer at that time was no. At most, $5 million during the interim, otherwise we're going to need special session. So, in order for those tiny homes that got started by Ikaiko Marzo talking to Gilbert Aguinaldo, talking to Tulsi Gabber, talking to Hope Services, talking to Daryl Oliveira, talking to a whole bunch of people. In order for that to have come up, government didn't come in, okay? So what I did was I knew how much we passed in the 2018 session. I knew we passed a $50 million Ohana Zones funding for interim housing. And I don't know whether or not you guys were following the news, but basically I begged Governor Ige to make that into law because come July 1st, that would be at least some of that $50 million can go towards maintaining those tiny micro units that's out there and building some more transitional housing. And I am pleased to know that the veto session came and went because you would be surprised at how many people were against that Ohana Zones funding from being passed. All these, all these homeless advocates in Honolulu did not want the Ohana Zones to be passed. So it passed because the governor did not veto it, but he did not sign it either because, you know, it's an election year. He didn't want to get upset all those homeless advocates who said it wasn't helpful for them because it was helpful for us. So another thing I am looking at is we also passed a $500 million affordable housing. Okay, I wanted to know how much, really $200 million of that is something we can try to grab. And only $30 million of that is spoken for in Maui. That's $170 million that we can use to hopefully fund um, Senator Ruderman's land swap idea 
among other things. So that is what I have been working on to try to see. We are, I see that my time is up. We are looking toward solutions. Um, the land swap idea is not a done deal because it may take a long time. I found out just yesterday it may take just two years just to get an application through, and we want people in right away. So there are other ideas that may be faster, okay? And one of those things is we're going to be talking about that, and we're going to thread it out with, through you folks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I just wanted to point out that um, Diane Lay is here from um, Research Development at the county. Um, the others are not here yet. In the back, I can't see, I'm blind. Um, I, we're expecting Talmadge uh, from Civil Defense and also Roy Takemoto from the Mayor's Office. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Senator Ruderman. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Russell Ruderman. I'm state senator for Puna District. So happy to be here. And I want to thank uh, Eileen O'Hara, our council member, for organizing this and it, inviting us to be part of it, too. Thank you. Because of this lava, we didn't have our normal town hall where I normally would summarize the last session. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take two minutes and summarize the previous session and then use my remaining time to talk, talk about the lava situation. Um, I was able to get some successes this year at the legislature, of which I'm, I'm very happy because the previous years were kind of long years in the desert compared to this one. We, we, I was able to get, I'm talking, I, uh, okay, all right. I was able to get uh, money for the rat lungworm lab at the UH Hilo, which I've been working to do for about four years. There's been a lot of politics in the way. And the good news there is it's better than just getting a bill passed. With, with uh, the wisdom of our money chairs, we got it inserted into the budget so that it's recurring. And as m many of you know, Pune is ground zero for rat lungworm. We haven't gotten a lot of support statewide for it. But finally, at least uh, Sue Jarvie's lab at UH Hilo will be funded. And other, uh, this wasn't my bill, but I was very involved in this fight. I was very pleased that we passed on medical aid in dying this year, sometimes called physician-assisted suicide. It's also been a multi-year effort. I'm very glad that we got it done. Um, I, I'm very proud that my name is on the year's largest environmental bill. I think it's the largest one. We passed a bill to regulate pesticides statewide. And it's a bill that also is five or six years in the making, uh, starting with the county efforts that were shot down by the courts. And it regulates pesticide use around schools, requires disclosure of restricted use pesticides, and phases out chlorpyrifos, which is a, a neurotoxin that ought to have been banned nationally but was not. It's a relatively small step, but the fact that it got through at all is a really big step. It wouldn't have happened if progressives and environmentalists weren't energized this year and that it was an election year. It was a bit of a perfect storm. And let me thank our congresswoman's father, Mike Gabber, who's my colleague of the Senate, who took my bill, and my job was to keep my mouth shut while he made it succeed. And we both did our jobs, and I'm very happy about it. My other big effort this year did not succeed. I'll return to it next year. I would really like to pass a $15 an hour minimum wage as the best way I know to lift us out of poverty. So now we're in the lava situation. Uh, you know, we've all worked with the emergency phases, trying to work with civil defense and get information out, uh, road closures and all that. And that is, is a, uh, Ms. O'Hara said, took up the first few weeks of the process. And I'm also aware as a Pahoa business person of some of the secondary and tertiary effects of this lava flow, which is that a lot of people didn't just lose their homes, but they lost their livelihood. And Pahoa is in danger of dying. I think you all know that. It's my hope that we can pressure our, 
our county administration to open up a lava viewing area, which would save the town. And it's my hope that we do it soon before it's too late. I encourage you to, to join me in that effort. And then the big thing that I have taken on um, is I've been working on a relocation proposal. Some of you may have seen me talk about it on Big Island Video News and elsewhere. And it's my big idea. I, I'm trying to think of what can I do about this as a state senator. And after thinking about it night and day for weeks, I continue to think that this is the best idea I can contribute to the, to the discussion. And the idea is that we take some unused state land that's uh, not far from Makuga Market, downhill from Makuga Market. I am not talking about Hawaiian homelands. I want to make that clear. So it's DLNR land that's not being used for anything and is not native forest. And it's my proposal to open some portion of that up, maybe a thousand acres for uh, housing lots, for one acre lots to be offered to people who lost their home and or their property to the lava inundation. It would require the county building one road, but this subdivision would then have water and electricity and we could by doing so, we could compensate people for their land in the inundated zones and give them motivation to not want to rebuild there because I think we want people to not rebuild in the lava inundation zone. We want to give them a motivation and a financial first step to rebuilding elsewhere. Now, I realize there's different solutions for different people. Many folks don't need this. Many folks will go wherever they want. But I think there's 500 to 1,000 people who do need some help. And it's my thought that we can take care of this community, not just by scattering people to the winds and finding four walls for everybody, but maybe we can take care of the community as a community and relocate them, those who want to be stay together, in a beautiful area that will be better than it was before. And we'd be caring for this disaster-stricken community with aloha. And it would be an example to the country, an example to the world. Unlike, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of misinformation about my proposal, but I want to make it clear that it would be very cheap to do it. This thousand acres of state land is free. It's what I can bring to the table. And I've already had DLNR tell me, okay, it's a miracle, you guys. I had the land manager of DLNR <clears throat> call me up and say, whatever you need. I heard that from both the Big Island land manager and the statewide one. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I've had expressions of support from both the governor and the mayor. But it's a bold and new idea. And it requires courage. And I'm asking you folks to do one of two things. Either help me make this idea better or help me find a better idea or support this idea. The way you can support it is by calling the mayor's office and expressing your support for it. There's some petitions online. To me, I've been prop I proposed this a month ago. Everybody said, what a great idea. Nothing has happened. So I'm trying to light a fire. Because the idea, yes, this is big, this is bold, it's out of the box, but we're facing an unprecedented situation. And bold new ideas are appropriate. There's nothing wrong with thinking outside the box for how we can take care of our people. The idea would be that your, your land, or if you're Leilani or Kapo, your land would be condemned, or perhaps the development rights taken away. You would get some money for that, but you can't build there anymore. And you get a shot at one of the lots at this soon-to-be-beautiful new subdivision, which has water, electric, and access to the highway. And uh, it's my, uh, it won't be fee-simple land. It's very, very difficult to get the state to sell land. But it, it could be a 65-year lease that we would perhaps ask a nonprofit to administer so that it could happen quickly. And there's two points I want to emphasize, because there's some misinformation. It could happen very quickly, and it can happen very cheaply. I'm convinced of that. I've already asked my Senate attorneys to review my proposal, and there's no new law that's needed before we do it. So I think we'll need a special session to ask for some money and maybe some tweaks to the law to make it easy. But it could be done right now if we had the will to do it.
And I, I'm asking you folks to help me uh, create that will to do it. So that's my big idea. I, I've been guided to this idea through a, through a series of a series of seemingly coincidences, but the fact is there's a state law on the books, and it has been used in the past. It was used to relocate tsunami victims from Hilo. It's been used uh, in uh, Mililii. It's been used on Oahu a couple of times. There's nothing new or radical about it. It's on the books to help people with state land in times of disaster. That's where we are. That's who we are. We're people who need help in a time of disaster. This state land is waiting there to help us. And by the way, I'm very sensitive to the fact that a lot of agriculture was lost. A lot of farmers lost their land and their living. And I had, a couple of years ago, begun a proposal to develop an agricultural park in the lower section of this same land. And it could easily be that we do both a residential community, an agricultural community, and ocean resources for fishing and recreation. It would, it would be taking unused, albizia-laden state land and making a beautiful new community. And I humbly ask for your support on that project. Thank you very much. Aloha. Can you guys hear me in the back? I'm so happy and so proud and so grateful to uh, be a representative and serve this very special community. I've heard throughout the last month, Puna Strong, and from where we just came from, the blessing and opening of these tiny houses, to what we're hearing today, to the conversations I had earlier this morning, Puna is strong because of you. Puna is strong because of her people. The strength and the resilience and the courage that all of you have and continue to show in coming up with out-of-the-box ideas to help one another, to help this community get through this unprecedented situation is what makes this community so very special. It's aloha. And so I have a lot of my colleagues every single day that I'm in Washington. I just got back last night. Every day that I'm there and I'm going to the House floor for votes, Democrats and Republicans, everyone is asking how you all are doing. You're on the hearts and minds of a lot of folks in the country that you may not be aware of. People who are offering their help and offering their assistance and wishing that they could do something to help the thousands of people who've been affected and displaced because of the lava. Uh, as your congressional delegation, all four of us have been working together from the very beginning to make sure that as far as federal resources go, we're doing everything we can to deploy them as quickly as possible. Uh, someone laughed earlier when they said that government moves slowly. It does. Uh, FEMA in this situation we're on the ground from day zero, and it is not the norm that as soon as the individual assistance was approved to stand up the disaster recovery center the next day, but that's what happened here. It's a big deal. And now that they're staying open through the 4th of July, this uh, will continue to make sure that all those affected have the opportunity to go in and put your name in, file your application, and go and access both the federal, but also the state and the county resources and the nonprofit resources that are available to you there. Uh, I have some friends here who are farmers. Many of you may be farmers, and uh, I've heard from a lot of folks how you've lost everything. Maybe your crops weren't covered by lava, but they're dead, or you can't get to them, and this is the livelihood of many people in this area. So one thing that we're working on now, your federal delegation, is lobbying the administration and the USDA to come up with further emergency assistance, specifically for those of you who have farms and who've lost so much. There's a number of things that are happening in Congress on many other issues 
we're working on dealing with a lot of those while simultaneously making sure that the disaster that is affecting your community here uh, is kept top of mind in Washington. Uh, at a certain point, we will be looking to see if we can get emergency appropriations at the federal level to be able to help deploy support here. There are short-term emergency needs. We saw the transitional tiny houses being opened earlier. We need more of them. But we really need to be looking towards long-term solutions with creative ideas like the one that Senator Ruderman is talking about. So he's trying to light a fire. I'll add my fuel to that fire because it's those creative solutions that have gotten us this far and that will continue to bring us together with a plan forward for the future. I want to mention because of the large agricultural community that we have here, uh, the Farm Bill. Every five years, Congress passes a huge bill that is intended to provide support to our agriculture community, as well as food stamps and food assistance for those who need it. Now, I voted against the Farm Bill that passed through the House because it didn't help small farmers and community farmers who are actually growing food for our community, like many of you here. It provided a huge amount of assistance to big national and multinational agribusiness corporations, sometimes at the harm of small farmers. We're looking to change that. The Senate bill just passed yesterday, the Senate version of the Farm Bill, where something pretty historic happened that I think provides a lot of opportunity for us here in Hawaii. The majority leader, Mitch McConnell, included a provision to legalize industrial hemp. He's got a lot of, and even, well, this is coming from the Republican majority leader, unexpected, but he has a lot of folks in his state of Kentucky who want to farm hemp. So this is an opportunity for the country. It's an opportunity here in Hawaii and something that we hope will remain as this bill moves over uh, to the House in the final version of the Farm Bill. Uh, there's a number of other issues. Uh, I know we want to stay focused on what's happening right here in this community. Please know that we are here for you. I want to introduce to you my Hawaii Island representative, Ilihia Johnson. You'll see him around, but uh, he is my eyes and ears here in the community, along with many of you who I'm in touch with when I can't be here. But I'm grateful to be here today and look forward to hearing your thoughts, ideas, and your concerns. Mahalo. Thank you, Tosi. Thank you all, panelists. So before we transition to this next part, I have two apologies to make. Apparently, I steered people in the wrong direction to the bathrooms. So you do not go out the doors. The bathroom's actually right around this corner. Men and women, sorry about that. And then I also have to apologize because I know that I said that we weren't going to be taking any questions, comments, or anything from the audience coming this way. But I've decided to make one exception, and I think you'll be happy that I did. Kaika Marzo would like to say hello. Hello, everybody. Oh. I know we've been going through a lot of stuff in Pune here, but um, some new development that we at Pu'u Honua Opuna. Um, we had acquired uh, 15 acres of property right on the other side of the transitional homes. So a family from Puna, a local family, um, Lloyd Takalikod and the Takalikod family from uh, Tangerine Acres, they had donated 15 acres of property for more transitional homes. <laughs> So um, yesterday was the first groundbreaking uh, by Goodfellow Brothers um, Construction Company. 
and they started to do the groundwork already. So these transi transitional homes that we are planning on is for families. Um, so they're a, li a little more bigger than what we have planned on um, for these ones in Pahoa. And um, we are looking at 50 units. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we have, um, have been uh, planning on for the next um, couple weeks. Um, also, we have a lot of people, local people, local families that have been affected by um, the lava and, and by the eruption coming and volunteering and helping out and um, making it a community project for, um, for our community here. So um, thank you, everybody, for supporting our hub here. Um, we just did it. We just did our hub just, just because being from this area, being... Born and raised, my dad was a uh, um, he was one of the cane workers up up in Puna Sugar Cane here. My mom, my grandparents, my grandfather had the first running toilet in Pahoa. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, my my family comes the roots of my family goes deep in this this area. So, you know, with all the places that I've traveled in Puna, Kalapana, Kapoho. Um, just my heart goes out to everybody. So, you know, just the local people here, we all sat down the day of uh, May 5th and just came together and said, we got to do this now, and we did it. So, and everything that we did here is all for you guys. Mahalo, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Kaika. Okay, so you know Tulsi's age he just introduced. I'm going to have him read the questions. Um, what we're going to ask for during this part is if he needs clarification, if it's your question and you recognize it, if you can please um, offer that clarification. Other than that, we would like to just keep the comments um, from being read off the papers. Okay, thank you. Oh, and I'm going to try and capture most of it on the sheet over there, but, but uh, spelling doesn't count, and I'm not going to get every single idea. But don't worry, because it's being recorded, and our office aide is going to make a wonderful report. Uh, just real quick, this was supposed to be live broadcast on the office of Eileen O'Hara Facebook. I know Kainoa over here is also trying. We're having a lot of Wi-Fi problems, but we do have Big Island Video News here. This will be online in its entirety later if you need to review it or if anybody's asking. Thank you. All right. How about a round of applause to Kendra and Barbara for helping put all this together and for our officials who have been here this morning or this afternoon, rather. So, uh, there were lots of great questions. A lot of them kind of swirled around the same topics. So in the interest of time and to make sure we get, have enough time for answers, I've summarized a lot of the questions together. So, the first area talks about access. And uh, maybe this is either state or, or county. So, the, question, the questions are around access. Why all people can't access the shore? That was one that came up a couple of times. Uh, and maybe there are plans for access later to the shoreline as we you know, know a little bit more about how stable everything is. Why has the National Guard not set up more, uh, more stringent perimeters? You know, some people can go in, some cannot. And finally, there was a concern about Visitors being able to see what residents cannot in terms of tour helicopters, lava boats. Um, so how come tourists can see, residents cannot see? So who'd like to take up the issue of access first? Uh, tough question. And part of the reason that we don't have uniformity at the roadblocks is the nature of the event. It's very dynamic. I think we all um, wanted to go back to Uncle Robert's, right, down in Kalapana. And I know I made it down there about a month ago, first trip. Uh, I went with Auntie Emily. <laughs> and uh, there were very few people there, but it felt good to return to some normalcy. And the music was great. And then people started hearing about it. And 
the rumor was all you had to do was say, going to the market, going to Uncle Robert's at the roadblock on 130. And that worked for three weeks. Then last week, things changed and nobody could get by the roadblock. How unfortunate. But that has to do with the instability of the cracks uh, out on 130 where we're going over those steel plates and the fact that um, they're seeing a rise in the, the temperature. And they don't want to have all of us down at Uncle Robert's and have an event that's going to uh, block 130. And then our only way out is along Chain of Craters Road, which has been improved just as a one-lane dirt road. It's kind of dangerous, especially at night. And so it's all about safety. And while it doesn't seem like that, it seems like we're being hampered from enjoying ourselves once again. Um, there is that backdrop. So I realize that it's hard to uh, stay abreast of all of these changes. And that's one of the challenges I've been tackling just using social media. But um, that's the main reason for the lack of access into areas. For instance, uh, access to the shoreline. I remember that one day that we opened Po'oiki for swimming. You know, did anybody get down there on that one day and get a placard? Uh, somebody did. There was a long line at the community center. The next day, the flow broke to Kapoho, and we couldn't go down there anymore. So it's really about safety. And one thing that I've heard from civil defense and from our engineers is that we won't be able to rebuild or decide which roads to rebuild, which access to reopen until we have a six month quiet period on the flows. That's going to take some time, guys. Right now, the, the flow down in Kapoho is still oozing. It burned a house on Friday, two homes on Thursdays, Thursday. So it's still taking its toll down there. There were about 20, 25 homes that had not been um, inundated with lava. So it's about safety, and I can't say when we're going to be able to access all of those areas again, but we sure miss them. And it's been particularly difficult as it's summertime, and we have nowhere to recreate. The kids are out of school. They don't have the gym. They don't have the skateboard park. They can't go to Po'oiki. We can't go to Ahalanui. And Kapoho is gone. So it's been a really rough time. And just letting you know, I'm going to be having a fun day on July 21 down at the Hawaiian Shores Park where they have a swimming pool and um, lots of uh, games for keiki. So that is going to be an open event. So. Think about it, if you're with an organization that can provide some kind of recreational activity, this is very much needed right now in our community. So thank you. Thank you, I just want to add a couple of things. And as Eileen O'Hara said, it's about safety. So since one week after the event, the disaster declaration, um, Hawaii Tourism Authority had approached the state legislature about trying to get a lava viewing area, okay? Because it was at the time when the cruise ship stopped. And I don't know when, whether or not you folks remember that. Businesses remember that. It was a, so the idea was by, by creating a lava viewing area, it would allow, because Volcano National Park was closed, it would allow tourists to be able to come see the lava and as well as residents come to see the lava. Since then, there have been multiple ideas about lava viewing area. My husband has one, but he needs to flesh it out, first, and you can talk to him directly about it. I'm not going to bring it out here. But one idea is like over by Lava Trees Park, okay? But that is a closed area. And let me tell you why and it goes under the rubric of safety, why that is not being allowed right now. H2S, SO2 is a huge concern. A lot of us, and you know, I want to thank Tulsi Gabbard for donating so many respirators, um, but that came and went. Thank you. Okay, but even when she donated them, I remember calling Department of Health because I was thinking about 
supplementing it, although she bought out the entire state supply, by the way. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, I called the Department of Health and I said, why can't people, you know, with respirators go check this out or with, S with SO2 monitors? A number of you folks were able to buy these SO2 monitors, these portable ones from Amazon or wherever it is that they sell them. The answer was, you folks are not trained. So I said, well, why not train them? And I know Ikari Komarzo over in Puhonua Opuna on how to use these respirators. It's as if we're not smart enough to grasp how to use these SO2 monitors. And we don't want to be able to give anybody a false sense of security of using these respirators and SO2 monitors. So it is like, it took me a long time just to get them to have these SO2, or by the way, when I, this started, it shocked me that Department of Health did not have SO2 monitors in Pune. They had them in Mountain View. They were going to send the, the portable ones over to Maui. Going, this is where the lava event is. So now we got, we got them, and it, then it took me a while to get them to make the results public. And when they, it was, I, I, those who, who follow my um, Facebook feed sh showed how unuser friendly those readings were when they finally published them. Now, with EPA, when I talked to Senator Schatz, to, uh, now they've got it a heck of a lot easier to read. But it goes towards trying to get into the Department of Health's idea that, you know, we do have a brain. We do know if, when, when we're trained, how to use these things. And we can time the four hours or less needed after the, the respirators expire to allow us to go into these um, areas. So um, it's a question of educating them. And hopefully now that we're going to have a new Department of Health director, hopefully it will be a lot easier. Thank you. The next topic is permitted homes versus unpermitted homes. So a little bit of background just to summarize the questions that have come in. Um, there has been FEMA assistance for folks who have lost permitted homes, but other folks have lost homes that were not permitted. They're not able to access that FEMA help. So. Um, how can FEMA help those people, or is it a state or county effort to help people who lost unpermitted homes? Also at the county level, so Eileen, are there thoughts to change the building codes or relax somehow the building codes as we get folks resettled? And one interesting suggestion was instead of, or maybe in addition to building new homes for folks in this new subdivision, uh, we help folks build homes land they already own elsewhere? Thank you. Uh, it's an excellent question, and as we all know lots of folks live in unpermitted structures in Pune. Uh, it, it's compounded by the fact that a lot of people who lost their homes didn't have insurance, or insurance hasn't kicked in for various reasons. Uh, the proposal I'm trying to promote to, to replace people's home, homes from the start, we've been committed to the idea that if you, if you lost your primary residence to the lava, you're in line for one of these lots, whether it was permitted or not. I'm just 100% clear that that's the right thing to do. And uh, I, don't, I can't speak for FEMA. I don't know that there's a solution to that situation at FEMA. But from my point of view, in terms of our state response, I'm going to do everything we can to take care of the people that were affected, and it's not it's not a consideration to me whether it was permitted or not. Yeah, we have uh, Dana here in the back from FEMA. If afterwards you have a specific situation that you'd like to get an answer to, I encourage you to go and speak with him. But what I have been told is that FEMA housing assistance only covers permitted homes and uninsured homes. So. 
there are other forms of assistance, however. So just because your home may have been unpermitted, don't think that you shouldn't go to the Disaster Recovery Center because there's a whole host of other programs uh, and benefits and resources that are available to you even if you may not be eligible for one. Um, just some examples, there's a, there's a program uh, to help with mortgage insurance for disaster victims. Um, this is not only talking about what damage has been done, but it's talking about money that may be used for uh, either uh, financing the rehabilitation of an existing home with zero money down, or money that may be used to uh, rebuild or build a new home. Uh, there's a home investment partnership program 100% of those funds can be used for urgent needs as well as uh, things that can be waived to help speed up the delivery of these federal resources. Um, one other thing, and we'll work with your county council members on this, and we've reached out to them, the Community Development Block Grant is something that funds a lot of the county programs. Uh, those funds can be reprogrammed towards disaster relief here in Pune. This hasn't happened yet because I understand a lot of those funds have been earmarked for other longer term housing projects, but as we talk about what are the short term needs directly dealing with those who've been affected by the lava flow, this is another resource of federal funding that we can look to tap into to help with this initial effort. Just to weigh in real quickly, um, since the permitting issue is a county issue, um, it's interesting that we do have quite a large quantity of unpermitted homes in Pune, probably the most of any district. I can't even venture a guess how many are unpermitted. And it was a, something that I've been talking about with my legislative assistant in terms of developing some type of amnesty program because it does put the homeowner at risk. So if you're in that boat, if you had an unpermitted home and you uh, lost it and you're not eligible for FEMA, I agree with Senator Ruderman that any program that we put forth at the state county level should be available to anyone who lost their primary residence. You've been taxed for your primary residence, right? Even though it wasn't permitted, it shows up on your tax bill. And that is the bottom line as far as I'm concerned. That's your primary residence. You might have been getting a homeowner's exemption on that. That is the records that we should be looking at, not the permitted records, because otherwise Puna would be sold very, very short. So I agree on that one. Thank you. So I just want to weigh in just less than a minute. Um, as part of the housing task force with Senator Ruderman, um, basically, we've got the county to agree with, uh, to Mayor Kim to expedite permitting for our evacuees. Because I know some of you have already started rebuilding, which is wonderful, by the way. So um, now our task is to try to get after acquired permits. Hopefully, that will be also expedited. But thank you. Thank you. I know part of the question was about making it easier to build uh, second houses and stuff. I did get in a, uh, asked the Department of Health to make an exemption for a couple of rules, which they said yes to, and that is that you can uh, add a bedroom or add a room or even a guest house to your home without having to trigger the requirement to upgrade from a cesspool to a septic. That was a very big financial burden towards expanding your house, and we've got an uh, exemption to that for the Big Island. I also hope... I'm also pressuring the county to consider, you know, modifying its accessory dwelling units. You know, we, ought, we need to go back to allowing second homes on land. We need to create affordable housing in all of the above ways, not just one. And I also hope the county will become flexible on permitting movable homes. It may even be mobile homes or simply modular homes. And in a way, that's the only logical way to build in Lava Zones 1 and 2 going forward. So it's not only, it uh, should be an option, it actually should be a requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So um, we have two questions about businesses. And one is for you, Eileen. 
Are there any thoughts being given to property tax breaks for commercial property in Pahoa or in the surrounding areas? Uh, I hope there is. I've already uh, directed that to our real property tax director, Lisa Miora, because of the requests from our local businesses. Uh, most of the businesses in Pahoa Town have taken a considerable hit up to a uh, loss of about 50% of their normal business. And it only stands to reason that if we're giving tax breaks to those who live near where the lava has flowed, because well, we're, we're going to see um, a percentage decrease in your real property tax bills next this fiscal year, which started um, starts tomorrow, um, in areas like Nana Valle and places that are very close to the flow, you're going to see a percentage decrease in your real property tax bill. All of those properties that have been taken are going to see a zero tax bill. I already got mine for my Capojo lot. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's uh, one way that we will be able to address the business losses in Pahoa Town. But I also have to uh, shout out to Main Street Pahoa, Amadeus in particular, who took it upon himself to do a, a promotion program for the businesses in Pahoa. And I think it's really paying off. At least from what I'm seeing, there's way more people in town in the evenings, eating at the restaurants and going into the stores. And we need to encourage that more. I actually talked to a lot of people who stayed away from Pahoa for the first few weeks thinking that we needed space or something. <laughs> anyway, we don't. We need their business. And so um, getting the word out that Pahoa is alive and well um, could use more parking. Uh, but other than that, <laughs> but other than that, that's something that I've, I've been working on. We uh, need to encourage people to uh, frequent our businesses here in town. Thank you. So just a quick add-on, since you mentioned parking, there was a question about bus routes. Um, if there are any thought to maybe altering them so that they can better serve the now re uh, rearranged landscape of, of Puna. So if there's any thoughts on that. There are. Um, the bus routes have been modified because of the inability to get into areas that they previously serviced. We are trying to keep Puna serviced by the bus. As you all know, our bus system is not what it should be. And one of the actions that we took Friday, yesterday, seems like ages ago, um, was to pass a GE tax surcharge of one quarter percent. I know that sounds harsh, but guys, the county was broke before this event. And now that we have this event and we lost the real property taxes that I just referred to, we have a $5 million hole in this fiscal year budget coming at us. So we passed the quarter percent, that's one quarter of a cent on every dollar extra that will go into providing for rebuilding highways, which obviously we're going to need here, rebuilding our bus system from the bottom up, new buses and making a reliable spoken hub system for Puna. And that is alive and well with the actions that were taken at County Council yesterday. So we have something to look forward to as we build that system. Thank you. Mahalo. Um, this next question I'll give to you first, boss, is uh, what kind of help will be available for farmers who are affected, either right in the area or you know, due to the uh, the emissions, the air quality, they've been having trouble with their crops. Thank you. First, uh, this applies to farmers as well as other small business owners who've been affected here. The assistance you can get from the Small Business Administration, who also has someone here in the back named Garth. If you have questions, you can talk to him about your specific situation, but they offer federal low interest disaster loans to businesses of all sizes as well as private nonprofit organizations homeowners and renters businesses of any size may borrow up to two million dollars 
to repair or replace disaster property damage. This applies to small businesses in aquaculture uh, and in other areas. Can also apply to the combination of property damage as well as working capital loans. There are other details here as far as what homeowners are eligible for, what renters are eligible for. Uh, so it's great that SBA is here and of course they have someone at the Disaster Recovery Center. Um, with regards to agriculture, uh, the USDA already has some programs that are available to help provide emergency assistance. What we're working for is to get those numbers plussed up substantially. Right now, the State Department of Agriculture is assessing losses more than $14 million. At the USDA, they estimated the cost of loss to be much higher at somewhere between 35 to 84 million dollars to restore those farms that have been lost. So the USDA Farm Service Agency uh, is accepting disaster assistance program applications. They offer micro loans that are available to all farmers, not only those who've been affected directly by lava, uh, micro loans and startup loans uh, for you to be able to try to get started again, as well as ownership loans to be able to purchase new land and construct buildings and improve facilities if that's what you're looking to do. Uh, there are a few other programs that the USDA also offers at the federal level. Uh, again, this time is critical to go to the Disaster Recovery Center and get that process started because there's a lot of folks, 244 have already applied with the SBA of those 244 so far, as of three days ago, four of those have been approved. So they're working through, but they've got quite a backlog. So if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to get your name and your information in there as soon as you can. Thank you. I've also been working with farmers on various levels to try to come up with a solution. You know, it's much worse than most of us non-farmers realize because let's take the example of a papaya farmer. They're rotating their crops. You know, they have three different fields. They're rotating them and harvesting one per year. They just lost all of them. Even if they were to find new land tomorrow, they don't get their first income for a year. And if they're a family business, there's no unemployment insurance for them. So they're hurting in some ways uh, worse than most of us. I met just the other night with the Nurserymen's Association and many others. Those are the people that uh, represent the orchid growers primarily. And the Farm Bureau is there. And I've, I was pitching to them my ag park slash relocation idea. And they're very interested. That particular land wouldn't be suitable for the papaya growers because it's pahoyhoy. But there is, uh, it would be suitable for everyone else, especially the orchid farmers or aqua, aquaculture. And I've also been, you know, the, we've talked about this event, bringing people together. I found myself uh, working closely in meetings with Shipman Estate and uh, the Farmers and Ranchers United, people I weren't aligned with in the past. And uh, I've been working with them. And Shipman, uh, there's a group called Farmers and Ranchers United that has developed a uh, clearinghouse kind of website where you can go if you have farm land available. You can list it, describe what kind, what it's suitable for, and if you're looking for farmland, you can go there and peruse the different options. They're trying to match people up island-wide with who just lost your acreage and who might have some acreage that might be suitable for that. So once again, I'd hate to sound like a broken record, but if I can get support for my proposal, there's an agricultural park in there that will be the single, single biggest help I've heard proposed for our farmers. Yeah, mahalo. Um, Joy, you have anything you want to add to that on farmers? No, not really, except that, you know, USDA has a whole bunch of grants as well as SBA loans. It, by the way, just because it st stands for Small Business Administration doesn't mean you have to be a small business to apply for a loan. So please use the resources that Garth back there is going to be providing you. It is the loan, it is the financing arm of FEMA, is SBA. So they're also they're great for 
they're great for farmers. Um, one of the things that I intend to do to help out our farmers is to talk to the Department of Ag as well as DLNR to find out and and Kamehameha Schools Bishop Estate, which is our largest landowner here on this island, to find out how many, how much land is available that they can lease out to farmers. So that, that's my pitch, thank you. Great, mahalo. So we have about half an hour left. Uh, we have a whole bunch more questions. So if I could ask you to keep your... Uh... Oh, no, no, you sure? Okay. Um, so shifting from the ground to the sky now, there's a question about excessive helicopter noise. And I know this has been an ongoing thing. Perhaps it's a little worse in some areas now between tour helicopters um, as well as, you know, official helicopters conducting disaster response. So the question is, uh, how do you feel about the excessive helicopter noise? And another question was, have we thought about using more drones versus helicopters in order to cut down on the noise and the fuel burn and, and so on? So who wants to take that first? Oh. Just start briefly. This continues to be an issue that we're trying to address, uh, again, unified as a delegation with the FAA so they can step in and, and um, be a mediator in some ways for how uh, our airways are being used uh, so that it is uh, not, so that, the, so that the right balance is struck within the community. Uh, I've heard from a lot of folks who um, are extremely frustrated because they don't feel that balance is there. So safety is of course a, a great concern. Uh, folks within the community are concerned about the economic impact and of course the health and welfare of our residents. Um, I have heard about, uh, and I've asked the same question about drones, uh, particularly as they're uh, trying to get more footage and have oversight over the, the lava flow. Um, it's a safety concern is what I've been told. Because we have emergency helicopters that have to be ready to go at any time, being able to clear the airways of drones that sometimes they can't see until it's too late is a safety concern that they um, that they have. Yeah, you know the helicopter issue was a, a problem even before this event. I've been meeting uh, for a few years with people at the uh, FAA office in Honolulu. And by the way, Congresswoman's team has always been part of it, as well as the senators. We're trying to get some sense of cooperation from the helicopter industry. Uh, no progress so far, I would say, but they are going to be coming out to Pune in late July to have a meeting with us, us being the community. And if you are interested in this issue, I urge you to connect with a group called HICOP, H-I-C-O-K, Bob Ernst, who is, they're the most vocal people, and they're the first people that have made so much noise, pardon the pun, they made so much noise that the helicopter industry has come to the table for the first time, so maybe we're halfway there. I know you all are putting up with a lot of it. It's one of the reasons that I hope we get a viewing area because up in the helicopters is mostly tourists, and if, we, if a viewing area could be, we, we could respectfully open it up to residents only for the first few days or weekend. We'd have a sense of ownership of this phenomenon. And uh, I hope we can get more people on the ground. Because those people up in the helicopters aren't helping us uh, economically at all. They just fly over and go back. It might help Hilo, but it doesn't help Ho at all. All right, mahalo. And that is actually a great segue into a question about establishing lava viewing sites. Um, if you want to take that, and maybe Joy as well, because Lava, Lava Tree State Park is right there, and there's some properties. So what, is the, what are some of the thoughts going into creating a lava viewing area, and is there a possible timeline for that? Uh, good question. And I'm going to ask Diane if there's been any updates, any new meetings or information that I haven't been updated on, maybe you can come up and speak to. Diane Lay is our Director of Research and Development at the County of Hawaii. <laughs> he wants me to stand next to him so we don't get feedback. Yeah. 
no squeaking. So um, the administration is working on the various proposals, and we have been for many weeks. Um, I believe um, Councilwoman Eileen O'Hara addressed already the fact that you know we've seen some of the um, opportunities overrun by lava. So safety's first. We're continuing to work on it. We know that is a huge opportunity, um, both for residents who want to see. We also know that our visitors will come and see it. So we're working on it. Um, but again, safety comes first. So um, please be patient. We'll get to it, OK? OK, mahalo. Mahalo, Diane. And yes, it is something that we need to work on sooner rather than later. Um, the first thought I had was um, we cannot provide a visitor viewing site and go to the lengths of providing a parking area, uh, providing the LUAs, providing the security needed, and give it to the visitors for free. So I have proposed, and I've talked to Diane about this, that if we move forward, that um, residents should come Ina free, visitors pay. <laughs> Woo! So as you can tell, we are thinking about, we've been thinking about it since the first week, because the whole idea is to use this disaster as an opportunity, and not just let it kill business, but use it to basically keep jobs and increase business. We have this opportunity, let's, let's use it. If the, you know, just like the micro units occurred without government intervention, this may be one of those opportunities that private business may come in. And that's one of the things we are talking to private landowners about, about allowing their their places to be used as lava viewing sites and hopefully we could get some cooperation from the county as to to allow for um, passage to those private areas thank you uh, just to add to that and this came up earlier um, when we were talking about permitting we were talking about um, possibly requiring all new builds in lava zone one at least i i don't think we need to extend it to two but that's a discussion to be had um that they be somehow mobile or modular so that they can be deconstructed easily and removed from site this may be the new norm and we all have worked out new guidelines for the tiny home projects the evacuation village over here it hasn't gone down entirely without government involvement but um, planning has drafted guidelines for these tiny homes that give um, some exemptions and flexibility from our standard building code. This is something we need to develop further because Pune is special and we need that um, special consideration. Thank you. Hello. Anyone? Okay. So there, was, uh, there were a few questions about accessing homes that are within the evacuation area, but are still okay. And I, I couldn't really tell from the questions how the air quality is. I certainly don't know what any of the dangers of fire or anything like that are. But uh, one question says there are about 50 houses that are functional and intact in Leilani, but are part of the evacuation zone. So are there any thoughts to letting folks back in there? Um, yeah, you can discuss that. I'm sorry? Thank you, thank you. Allow people to live in their homes. I think that's what the gentleman was saying so that everybody knows what's on the table. We do have a kind of, I'll call it arbitrary designation of which areas of Leilani can be inhabited currently and which cannot. And there are homes that are within the uh, restricted area which are habitable. But it is, again, the concern about safety and SO2. Sir, you're going to have to have yeah. it's, a, it's about safety. Now, it's not, I think we're starting to have that discussion again with civil defense. I've seen two petitions come from Leilani residents 
Um, and that's one of the ways we can make headway here. But we need to do it in a manner that doesn't endanger anyone's health or uh, lives. So we can have that discussion and see if that area can be expanded to include some, if not all, of those homes that are habitable. But it is a decision that I can't make. It's a decision because we're under um, emergency declaration that only civil defense and those powers can make that decision. But I agree that it's one that we need to return to and look at the analyses and see if that is uh, safe for people to reside in their homes. Well, the only, I mean, I hate to pass the buck, but the law is pretty clear that the county is in charge of emergency. That's the reason why you see Talmadge and not Hyema, Tom Travis, talking to you about these things. So I'm going to defer to county civil defense. They have the authority. They have the jurisdiction. And, and, I, and I apologize, but that's the law the way it is now. Thank you. And on a similar track, for homes that are either in the area or have been destroyed, um, because civil defense has declared the area of Leilani uninhabitable, is the county going to buy property as a protective measure? Is the next step the county going to take uh, to be condemn those structures that still stand? Is the county going to use eminent domain to buy out the landowners? And how will the county deal with residents who have no desire to leave their homes and investments? Whoever wants to take that first. Just easy question, you know. Uh, that is very challenging because every situation is different. And in some cases, the homes are going to have to be condemned for the benefit of the homeowner because they're uninhabitable, even if they have not been destroyed by lava. There's been uh, structural damage. We've been having, I don't know how many earthquakes per day. We had at the beginning of this a 6.9 earthquake. And there are homes that have been made uninhabitable because they're structurally unsound. And they will either need to be reconstructed or, or serious renovations done in order for them to be a permitted dwelling once again. So that, like I say, every situation here is different. It depends on the air quality, the proximity to the vent. And um, I, can't, I can't give a blanket response to that question. But I think we need to start developing guidelines for where and when people can re-inhabit their homes. And that is a discussion I'd like to start sooner than later with our civil defense, since the um, power to allow that rests with them. Thank you. So I just want to add a little bit to that, and that is what that question is talking about is basically a policy, a county policy. The mayor has stated that he wishes that there will not be any rebuilding in lava zones one and two. And I know um, council person O'Hara doesn't want lava zone two to be part of the discussion. But that is what the mayor has had publicly stated. So in the discussions of a land swap idea, one of the ideas that we're just formulating. These are ideas that we're throwing up in the air to see which one sticks, okay? To see whether or not there's going to be enough support to go for a special session. One of the ideas is to really condemn certain areas that are considered to be uninhabitable or that the lava has inundated. Give those people a sum of money because there is, we have counted over a thousand lots un, you know, un vacant lots in Pune that are vacant right now, that does not have to go through subdivision laws, that does not have to do environmental assessments, and does not have to comply because they've already been approved. Give these people a sum of money to buy some of these lots, maybe even because there was a real property tax auction that came out recently, may, if, the, if the county had bought those, have those be made available now, so it, which is faster than creating a whole new community. But you know, these are ideas. 
Okay, and I'm, um, so it is a policy discussion. It's one of the policy discussions that we're thinking about to help people, to incentivize people to move out of Lava Zone 1 and not necessarily um, condemn or prevent people from moving back. Thank you. Hi, briefly. You know, there's a whole range of, uh, of ideas on this under discussion. But I do think that, uh, in terms of what I think is realistic, we're only talking about condemning homes that uh, a homeowner wants condemned. In other words, you want to get out of there and you want to get some money for it. Uh, there may be areas that we need to prevent building on, but I think then we would have to uh, compensate the homeowner for taking away the development rights. The idea that we should... The idea has been discussed of condemning all of Lower Puna and make it an international park, buy out everybody. I, I understand the idea is out there, but I think it's absurd because are we really going to add a few more thousand people to the homeless situation that we have now? I, you know, we have a severe crisis we have to deal with first. It would be foolish to make it twice as bad before we start to fix it. So I don't think that's going to be a very popular idea. Right now, condemnation, I think, is being talked about for people who need a way out. Okay. Just two parts about that discussion. Um, so one question that came up a bunch is, is there a timeline? Is there any thought to a timeline on any of this? Um, and second, how will the county um, work with residents who have no desire to leave their homes? If it's in that, kind of in that area. Anybody? Uh, Tutu Pele has no timeline, okay? And that is the overarching issue here. Um, when she decides to uh, go back to sleep, then we can start having more sound discussions and develop a timeline. But right now, we're not sure. And let's hope that she stays in the channel and doesn't expand into some of the other lobes that were very frightening for other subdivisions. So we don't know with timeline. The question was, is there a timeline? A timeline for you to decide when we can never go back in. OK. That, um, and that goes back to something I said earlier, which is something uh, civil defense is telling us, that they are not going to consider allowing people to get back into areas that are inaccessible currently until this eruption has been considered stopped for at least six months. That's in terms of road building and that kind of thing. There might be emergency roads building on a sooner basis than six months, but they're not going to pick up the plow and start building roads until six months out from the lava stopping. That's what we were told. That's not the answer to your question. No, that's not the question. Our homes that we cannot get into uh -huh. because of the civil defense barrier, right. when will they decide, can you give us a timeline, that it, it either is going to be livable or it will never be livable. Okay. Like, then we can go on with our lives, right? Okay, okay. Um, okay, that is, a, that is a, not a timeline that I can give you today, but I did say that we're starting that discussion with civil defense. And um, Diane over there is, is shaking her head. As part of the administration, we, we have to work with them to determine if they're willing to relax their current uh, requirements for roadblocks and allow residents back in. Again, I can't give you an exact time, but the discussion is starting. So hopefully it'll be within the next couple of weeks that we can get back to you on that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I can't speak to the timeline that the gentleman was asking about, uh, but I can speak to some other timelines. Uh, in terms of the relocation proposal I'm advocating for, uh, it's the first time we could realistically hold a special session is in mid-August, which is about five weeks from now. Um, and in order to do that, we'd have to have a proposal. We would have to have agreement from the county. This is what we want to do. So, and if, if we had that agreement and could go into that special session, if we did this relocation proposal, I. 
I could show you your lot in six months and we could have some homes built in less than a year. I talked this afternoon with one of the fellows doing the tiny houses and I said a year and he looks, why a year? Because I mean, they did that in 30 days. So I think there's a great need to give people hope, to give people a sense of what the future is going to look like. And although Pele has no timeline and this disaster might not stop, we have to move forward anyway. We have to give people a path forward and we have to give people a light at the end of the tunnel. It's my hope that we'll support a pro proposal like that. Thanks. Thank you. So we have an insurance question. Um, and this one sounds like a specific case. So to make this um, helpful for everyone here, what resources are available for people whose insurance company has denied their claim? Or what kind of advocacy can people find in regards to insurance? Anybody? All right. So um, j just to make clear, the insurance forum that occurred, I don't remember when, I think was May or June. Okay, it, everything happened so fast. Um, we thank um, Eileen O'Hara for hosting it, but that was put on by HSBA with the United uh, Policy Adjusters that came in from Maui that took out of their time and flew in with their expenses to come in. They are coming back, by the way, um, sometime in mid-July. I believe it's July 21. And at the time when we're having this forum, and I hate it's already POW, but, you know, there was an HSBA free legal clinic that was occurring over in Pahoa Community Center that could have answered a number of these questions regarding insurance. So um, the question is, so the insurance question, I really think you need to go to the July 21. If you give me your email address, I will tell you where and when it will be because there's going to be a lot of self-help there. They're going to teach you how to fight the insurance company. Right now what we're telling people is if you are denied to file a complaint with the insurance commissioner, but there are other ways to do that. Okay. Does that okay, great. Uh, we got two more questions since the access discussion. And these are, these are pretty good questions. So one is uh, there's somebody who who has uh, ancestral ties to Puna, and that person would like to get into the restricted area for cultural, cultural purposes and to visit ancestors, and that person was turned away by civil defense. Related to that, um, there was some talk earlier about going down to Uncle Robert's on Wednesday nights, and it's a resident from within the evacuation area who said there are some you know, extra folks kind of hanging around the area, not just going to Uncle Robert's coming out. So could we do extra extra patrols or extra something to safeguard, you know, maybe safeguard that route so folks can get into Uncle Robert's and get out and not sort of hang in the area? So if anyone wants to tackle that. Uh, I'm going to deal with the second part of the question, which was uh, getting to Uncle Robert's and I'm not really sure, does, does this resonate with somebody? Did they ask this question? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I was kind of wondering what you meant by, are we talking shady characters hanging out? Yeah, it's been on Wednesday night, the last couple of times, there's been a lot of reaction in the neighborhood, which is pretty quiet. Looking those, or just pacing the joint. And so I was asking about that, and also spotters, yeah, like the back sands apparently is happening. Well, I mean, like, what you're saying is if we do allow people to go we need to um, police it more carefully and that's a good point because it does open people up to nefarious acts and um, it's well known to all of us who live down here in Pune that we have a very active criminal element and they're very sharp and they seem to know how to get past roadblocks and get to where they're not supposed to be. And they are doing economic harm um, to the residents, many of whom had to evacuate their homes, which are still standing. 
but um, we recognize that is a problem. So thank you for bringing that up. I'll try to address the first part of that about the uh, um, Hawaiian, Hawaiian traditional access question. Um, obviously, if, a, if an area is truly unsafe, they're going to deny you access to it. But I have found that civil defense, as uh, firm-handed as they are, and as much as we complain about them being a little too strict for our tastes, I have found them to be very accommodating if you approach them directly with a reasonable request. And uh, that's just, they have accommodated every homeowner that they possibly can to get back into their home. They take you in with an escort. It's very labor intensive. It's not easy for them to say yes to, but they are, they're doing it. So if this person were to approach civil defense with this legitimate, respectful question, I believe they would try to accommodate you. And if I can help, bridge that gap, I would do so. Before I ask a question, because I live here of my generation, and when I got to go to a roadblock and it's my mother's birthday, and then they try to keep me out of the place, I get insulted. So thank you for trying to even address it. The way they work is they want to arrange a time to come in, they don't want to do something. Right, it's called an escort service, and we are using, uh, Escort service. I know. I, I joked with, I joked with. with well, we're using some of our neighborhood watch volunteers um, to do the escort service, and uh, I joked and about it. And he said, "Yeah, the tips were really lousy." But um, I also want to recognize because we have some of them here. Our CERT team. That's our community emergency response teams. Patty is in the yellow there. They have provided. They've provided so much services. We, you may not realize it, but we don't have many permanent employees in civil defense. I think all of six. And so we depend on the volunteers to do um, a lot of the activities, such as handing out the placards. And I want to thank the CERT for being there and being consistent. I see Judy Hull here. She is our Puna-wide captain for Neighborhood Watch. I want to recognize her, too, because... These guys have stepped up to the plate and volunteered endless hours for this emergency response. So thank you guys. And uh, yeah, there is some leeway with getting past the roadblocks. And I have had some success in asking the head of civil defense in special situations if it was reasonable and not dangerous. And they have been accommodating. So. If you have a special request like that, please let my office know. Thank you. OK. So we are almost out of time, folks. We have a bunch more questions, so we'll try and get through these quickly. One question is, is there thought given to making a central authority that would be kind of the point for relief efforts as well as connecting folks with uh, community resources? Yeah, the central point for all of these different county, state, federal, and nonprofit resources is the Disaster Recovery Center. Uh, I've visited them a couple of days after they stood up, and it's um, there, there's a lot of resources there and a lot of folks who are standing by to help you. Uh, there was a line when I got there, probably about 10 or so people, but they have a number of different stations set up where you can just literally sit one-on-one -on -one across from someone they can determine what kind of assistance you're looking for and point you in the right direction. That wasn't the question. The question was people who want to donate, help receive, give. Um, for money, Hawaii Community Foundation, uh, there is a volcano recovery fund. That Hope Services, Red Cross, Salvation Army, a number of neighborhood place of Puna, they all agreed that Hawaii Community Foundation, that's a 501c3. I know that Pu Honua or Puna also accepts donations, and but basically that's not a 501c3 yet. So if the deduction is important to you, then Hawaii Community Foundation. Otherwise, I know that Pu Honua or Puna also accepts money. As far as things, 
Puhonua Puna has a list, and Ikai Kumarzo left, but there is a, if you ever go there, they have a list of things that they need. So does Red Cross. Salvation Army will accept clothing and a lot of things. Um, it's not centralized, but that's because there, was, there is a community. I, I see Wairek here I, for, um, for Puhonua Opuna and World Kitchen and, and Food Basket. Food Basket, centralized hub for food. They provide food for World Kitchen, for, um, for bodacious ladies of Nana Valley. So food, food basket, money, Hawaii Community Foundation of Puna and Puhonua of Puna, and things, Salvation Army or Puhonua of Puna. Am I missing anything? Thank you. I would also plug Hawaii L in United Way, but I'm the chair, so I can't. That's all right. So um, there were a bunch of questions that kind of get into the specifics of relocation. And because it sounds like there's not a super solid proposal, and these are all pretty detailed questions, we can save those for another time as we're almost running out of time. But one question was, uh, for folks in Leilani, is there anything stopping them from selling their land before anything happens? Certainly at a higher elevation, perhaps. But and, and part of that question was also because for property tax purposes, the home's uh, property has been assessed at zero. What does that do to prices? And can folks still sell if they so choose? There's, there's no legal constraint on you selling your land, but you will maybe encounter some difficulties if there's a structure on it because uh, they may not, you may not be able to get it insured. So you'd have to have a cash sale only kind of situation. I'm sure there's people out there willing to engage in that kind of speculation, um, but really there's no constraints on you if you can find a buyer. The only thing I want to add to that is some people don't want to sell because they're concerned that their FEMA benefits may be affected. FEMA is out there and they had assured me it doesn't. In fact, so long as it is a disaster event that occurred here, they are willing, and you decide to move to Costa Rica, they're willing to give you your benefits in Costa Rica. But just to make sure Dana is out there, you can talk to him directly. So uh, going back to an earlier question about the insurance company that, that didn't want to do the claim and other issues that may come up, uh, the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, Hawaii State Bar Association, American Bar Association, and United Policyholders, they're doing free legal assistance for disaster survivors. They have a booth at the DRC, the Disaster Recovery Center. Um, they're... they're a very small number of these flyers that I have here, but you're more than welcome to take a picture of, of that if you want the details. I'll leave it up here. And as we are coming to a close, I just wanted to offer, if you guys want to wrap it up in maybe a minute or so, who would like to go first? I want to thank you all for coming and thank Council Member O'Hara for including us all in this forum. You know, um, Eliyahu mentioned there was a lot of questions about the relocation proposal. There's really nothing vague about my proposal, and I'd love to answer your questions. I, I encourage you to contact me or my office, because we could really use the support. To repeat, I'm trying to build a fire under the county administration to act and act soon so that we can stick to the timeline that I described. I really welcome your support. If you have a better idea, I welcome that also. I'm trying to provide hope and relief to my thousand disaster-stricken neighbors. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for taking the time to come here today. And to Councilman O'Hara, thank you and your team for uh, organizing the logistics to make this happen. Um, I'm grateful to have been here. I know a lot of the questions here were very county-centric, because that's where the action is happening. But I want you to know it's just been helpful to hear a lot of these questions, particularly around what is going to happen to your home if it's still standing, the questions about condemnation, eminent domain, the, basically uh, the future of the land that's been affected. So. 
know that we will continue to work together at the county, state, and federal level, uh, both within the construct of resources, but also looking at these creative ideas like Senator Ruderman is talking about to see how we can determine that path forward. So thank you so much for being here. As you all know, we are all here to help. I mean, we may disagree as to how to do it, but we are all open to ideas and we all want to help. And there are a number of volunteer organizations who are chomping at the bit, who, are, who want to donate land for tiny homes, who want to help pound nails. I have architects calling me, wanting to help design these tiny homes. So the whole idea is if we could put together a plan, hopefully we could get our community motivated and we can get our community back together. And we are all here to help and we are all thinking of multiple ideas on how to do it. Thank you. I want to thank everyone that uh, came t today to listen and to share your ideas and ask your questions. I also want to thank everyone sitting here for giving their time and agreeing to do this panel so that we could collectively uh, sit before you, all three branches of government, and listen to your concerns and develop the plan. As Senator Ruderman said, we need to have that plan, some plan and options before the state legislature within the next month or two in order to get some uh, action going. And the county is trying its best to start that planning process. And we have several different groups that are engaged in that. Some are internal, some are community groups. And um, I know that it's added a lot of meetings to my schedule, but it's good. And we will come up with reasonable plans that we can pitch to the state legislature in the next month or two. So something to look forward to. On another note, um, I just want to say, because it was in the news today, you all who are in private road subdivisions, the vehicle, abandoned vehicle bill is moving forward. We, we had a little problem, we had a little hitch there, where um, we've been doing it for 15 years, removing abandoned vehicles off of private roads, and our county attorneys suddenly decided that that wasn't legal, and it had to be codified, so that uh, code was written as quickly as we possibly could, and it's moving through um, the process and will soon be law. So, yay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, Emily is um, asking a question about the royalties from PGV. Royalties are paid on the electricity sold to Helco. The plan is shut down right now, so no more royalties. Um, she is correct. 50% of those royalties accrue to the state of Hawaii. 30% uh, accrue to the county and 20% accrue to OHA. And so we don't have um, clear disposition on the plant at this point in time. I can't speak for the state monies because that's not under our purview, but I can tell you at the county, we have almost $7 million between the asset fund and the um, relocation community benefit fund. When we find out what the disposition is with that plant, it's hopeful, we're hopeful that uh, that money can be distributed to Pune to help with some of this rebuilding. For instance, private roads, because we can't access our highway funds for use on private roads. So that's a possibility, just throwing it out there. Thank you. Okay, mahalo everybody. So, okay, real fast, because we are wrapping up. So, I, so, Auntie Emily, I've already talked to Senator Ruderman about this. I want to do an informational hearing as to what is happening with that asset fund because, frankly, I want to use that asset fund to relocate people. Okay, thank you. So, I understand, before anybody else uh, shouts out a question, I know that we didn't get all of our questions answered. To address that, Kendra, wave Kendra, 
Kendra from Councilwoman O'Hara's office will be compiling the questions and the answers along with the notes that Barbara has been taking. How about a round of applause for them for putting this together, taking these notes, 